If you think about the Bible, think about two very important verses. The Bible says this, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. So the Bible, the Word of God, the, the Bible is the book made up of 66 books that is the recorded Word of God. It is very important because number one, faith, faith comes through hearing the Word of God. And if for nothing else, as you sit here tonight and hear the Word of God read and taught, a byproduct of that is that the Holy Spirit increases, if you're a believer, increases your faith. Remember the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith? You can increase your faith the more you're under the hearing of the Word of God. And by the way, my parents were firm believers in that. Our family... Any time there was any service at the church, we had to be there. And all I knew is we were supposed, this is all my dad said, you've got, son, you've got to be under the hearing of the Word of God. And I never knew quite what that meant until I started reading the Bible, and I found out that hearing the Bible taught increases our faith, so that as soon as I was old enough, I remember volunteering to go on a team to take Bibles behind the iron curtain, and people said, aren't you afraid? I said, of What? You hear the Word of God, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I just knew the Lord would, would take care of me. Okay, the second verse, I said there's two verses. One is, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Here's the other one, the second one. It says, receive the engrafted Word, which is able to what? Save your souls. The reason I want to talk about the Bible tonight is, number one, it, if, if you believe the Bible, it will increase your faith, and you can go through life uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it will help. The more faith we have, the more we please God. But number two, what I find interesting is that, that there's a whole group of people that they get out from Sunday school, youth group, they get away from regular church time, they go off to college, and they wash out. Why? Why? Because they don't believe the Bible is true. So, our topic tonight, why should we believe that our Bible is true? And apologetics, and I'll show you how neat this is. Uh, you can actually write on it if it works. Apologia means to speak against something. It's a defense of. And so, apologetics is defending against the attacks that come of people that say you shouldn't believe the Bible because there are all kinds of historic errors, scientific errors, uh, moral errors. Do you know what one of the moral errors of the Bible is? That the Bible has the audacity, the creator of mankind and the inventor of marriage has the audacity to say that marriage is not defined by society, it's defined by God. And God defines marriage as one man and one woman that make a lifelong, unbreakable covenant. And, and our society doesn't want you to believe the Bible because it's intolerant. So why should we believe the Bible is true? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Next slide. How do you defend what we should believe about inerrancy? The bottom line of this book is, is it inerrant. That means with no errors, historical errors, moral errors, as in did God make a mistake? Is homosexuality okay as long as you're loyal and loving? Can two women constitute a family and adopt children and lovingly raise them if they stay loyal to each other? Is that a family? And God says no. Can two men that love each other or whatever they call it love, but whatever. Can two men be married and be a family? And God says no. Th that is sin because the Bible has no moral areas at all. No scientific areas that are, that are in error. So there are no moral errors. There are no theological errors about the presentation of Christ. There are no historic errors. There are no scientific errors. So how do we... How do we truly defend inerrancy? How can we, going off 
I mean, I went to Michigan State University. I remember my very first class at Michigan State University in 1976. Do you remember 1976? Any of you old enough? The whole country was just into this 200th anniversary. And I went off to Michigan State University in 1976, and my first two professors, my very first two classes in a secular public university, the first one said, my goal is to show you now, this was an English class. This wasn't philosophy. This wasn't comparative religions. This was English. He stood up and he says, my goal is to show you that the Bible is filled with mythology. I thought, why did you? I was sitting in the back. There were 500 students in the class. I thought, where'd that come from? I thought we were studying English literature. I guess because the Bible's written in English. That was his entree. But you see, people want to undermine your faith, and they're doing a good job. Uh, when Ken Ham comes in a few weeks in, on April 15th, one of the things that Ken Ham, the Answers in Genesis founder and the worldwide speaker, talks about is that, that we're really losing kids before junior high. I mean, they don't believe the Bible. I mean, they come along and they go along with it and they memorize the verses to get a candy bar or whatever, but they don't really believe it. A great majority... And, and he's done the statistical analysis that, that a great number of church kids, they checked out in grade school. They're just coasting in middle school. They start thinning out in high school. They're gone in college. And you know why? It's because they can't defend how this book can be the Word of God. So how do we defend what we should? You notice what I said, should. Now, tonight, you can just analyze your own life. This is not a, we're not going to have a discussion. You just have a personal discussion. This is a rhetorical uh, discussion. Do you really believe that this is God's word? Why you should consider whether or not you really believe it is that it's only the word of God engrafted into our hearts that can save us. And if you have a defective it's almost like uh, there have been two massive recalls and millions and millions of, of some of our medications in America. And all the people that bought those during that period of time, they're wondering whether they got the defective stuff. And see, it's okay, you know, if it's defective aspirin, your headache doesn't go away. If it's okay if it's defective, whatever. But if you make a mistake on the engrafted word and your soul is not saved, that's a little more serious than a headache. So that, that's what I'm talking about, what we should believe about inerrancy. Okay, we need to trust the God of the Bible. And uh, there we go. And ask ourselves, do we really trust God's word? Or have, have we gotten into this compartmentalized idea that, that I love God and trust him and he is great, but I'm just not sure about this. Because the problem is, you can't know the God up there without this. This is the revelation of who he is. This is his calling card. This is his, his explanation of who he is. He's written it down and he's revealed it. And so we have to ask ourselves, do you really trust not just God, but do you really trust his word? Okay, let me give you a quick panorama of biblical history. This is what your Bible teaches. Um, and and uh, I'm not going to cover creation. I'd love to, but Ken Ham will do it. Uh, creation, uh, according to the Bible, was about 6,000 plus years ago, approximately. You say, wait a minute, right, right now you said something that completely goes against everything the scientists say. I say, that's true, it does. But did any of those scientists witness creation? No. Did any of them actually write down the account of it as it happened? No. But the God of this universe did, and the way he wrote it, is it's entirely written in a child that heard what the Bible says would come to the conclusion that everything happened quite recently. Now, all the signs are there uh, that, that it's a recent event. Every time they, they, they try to, to uh, disprove some of these uh, for example, uh, the Grand Canyon, and they say that took, you know, you can look through the stratospheric or stratigraphic levels and, and see how long ago that was. And yet when Mount St. Helens, there's going to be a seminar on this uh, during our creation seminar time, probably in the chapel, but 
when Mount St. Helens in 1980 erupted and it laid down the stratigraphic layering, and then Spirit Lake had a leak, and these levels had hardened because they were hot mud and, and volcanic ash, and it had squashed down and made actual rock layers. But when the lake had a leak, it made a canyon, and there were exact, it looked just like a miniature Grand Canyon, and the whole thing happened in about uh, a, a relatively few months period of time. So what it, it scared the scientists because you know what they found out? You can actually have something that looks like the Grand Canyon in less than millions and millions of years. But this isn't our, our seminar tonight. The fall of man, Genesis 3, followed after by maybe a thousand years by the flood. The first hard date we have, the Bible dates Abraham, in fact, we know that, that the, the, the temple that Solomon built was built 480 years after the Exodus. And, and you can do simple math. I mean, it says that in the Bible. So we know when Solomon lived. I mean, even Wikipedia will tell you when Solomon and David lived. I mean, you know, even, even the secular world can date them. And all you have to do is go back 480 years, and that's when the Exodus was. And then all you have to do is the math between the time that the children of Israel were in captivity, that were slaves in, in Egypt, and you know how old Abraham was. So the Bible tells us that in about 2166 B.C., uh, Abraham was born. And we know, I mean, you're, you're right now dealing with hard numbers. Uh, the exodus then took place and all of the plagues. Uh, David, very hard number. Uh, Jerusalem just celebrated their 3,000th anniversary. I mean, they know when David existed. And then, of course, the exile when the children of Israel, when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was 70 years long. Of course, uh, the birth of Christ, uh, you know, it should be zero or one but it's actually 4 B.C. because Pope Gregory changed the calendar and you know all that Gregorian calendar that we have. Right now, if you want to know where we are, it's right here. Something fascinating, the Bible said that Israel would return to be a nation. Uh, they lost what, what we would call their nationhood, actually was taken away from them in 586. There has never been a, a king of Israel or Judah since 586. Now, Herod called himself the king, but he wasn't. But uh, they lost their, their right to sovereignty in 586. And so for 2,600 years, from 586, about right there, all the way through 1948, 2,600 years, Israel has not been under self-rule. No elected king over the nation. But in 1948, as God promised, Israel became a sovereign nation again. No other nation has been out of existence for 2,600 years. Scattered, that's what diaspora means. In AD 70, all the Jews were, were scattered all over the place. Uh, in fact, today in Israel, they speak over 100 different languages because they're Jews from every part of the world. Uh, A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed. They no longer could do sacrifices. They were scattered after a million of them were killed by the Roman general, uh, Titus. And they started coming back in the 1800s, late 1800s, until finally uh, they were recognized under the mandate. And the United Nations in 1948 gave them their own land. So something interesting is happening because the Bible describes this event. And it tells us what's going to happen after that. Uh, just for you to understand, the Bible, Genesis covers from uh, creation till Joseph's death. And so Joseph died in 1805 B.C. There is a, uh, about a 400-year uh, silence between uh, Joseph's death and uh, the time of Moses. Uh, when he takes the children of Israel out in 1446. So basically, the Old Testament goes... The Old Testament period goes from the time of Moses until the time of Malachi. That is about a thousand years. And so all of those Old Testament books are written in that thousand year time period. Then there's another period of silence. You see that? The 400 years of silence 
from Malachi to John the Baptist. No writing prophet. So there, there, no scriptures are here. No scriptures are here. And of course, there are no scriptures before this. And so there are these silent periods. Then the entire New Testament happens in about a hundred year period from the birth of Christ, 4 BC to 96 AD. And then the scriptures self-authenticatingly tell us something. I'm going to get into that later and probably, I don't know if we'll do it tonight, but the, the real question is, how do we know that the New Testament here is finished? And uh, it's very easy if you understand how the custodianship of the Bible took place. But that's just a quick view of church history. So why should we trust the Bible? And uh, my wife told me that I'm not supposed to talk to this computer. But uh, I will try not to. Okay, this evening we begin an apologetic series with a look at our Bible. It's one of the greatest studies we could ever share. Why? Because the Bible is the revelation of all that God wants us to know about everything we need to know. Now think about that little phrase. All that God wants us to know about everything we need to know. Now there's a lot of stuff we wonder about. And, and what I, I want to remind you is that we need to know. Deuteronomy 29, you know, the book of Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, there are a whole group of things called secret things. And many people spend so much of their life into what I call the white spaces. Do you see around these words, there's, a lot of, there's nothing here. And a lot of people, this is all they study in the Bible. They're studying what it doesn't say. And they're speculating on the white spaces. God says whatever is in the Bible is all that he wants us to know. I mean, I covered the 12 types of angels. I only said what the Bible says. There, there are just reams of books written about what the Bible doesn't say. What does it matter? Because it's everything we need to know. See, the, the key is what do we need to know? And God tells us. So, remember, if God hasn't revealed it in his word, either it's a secret or it's unimportant to us now. And he'll reveal it later when we need to know it. So we need to have that underpinning. So the more of God's word you trust, the more you know about all that really matters in life. And that's why if you get a little bit of the word every day, whatever portion, you know, we don't all eat the same. We eat different amounts. You don't have to read the same amount in the scripture. The key is to get a little bit, a little bit more of what really matters in life from the Word of God. So that's why. Now, why should we study the Bible? Well, turn to John 17, 17 in your Bible. And if you don't have this, this verse marked, this is why you should study the Bible. The why. And it's John 17, 17. And as you mark it, what you'll see is in your Bible, it'll say something like this. And, and this is utterly important. Sanctify them through thy truth. And, and now think about this. What does God call the Bible? God calls the Bible truth. So, and it's God the Son speaking. It's Jesus Christ. And if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, it's in red. Um, by the way, all of it should be in red because the scriptures, Peter said that, that it was the spirit in, of Christ that inspired all of the scriptures. So Peter affirmed the fact that all of it is divine, not just the red parts. But the elements I want you to think about from this verse as you look in your Bible, sanctify, that's a big word. God calls the Bible truth. And then look at, look at what Jesus states. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. And this is Jesus praying and talking to God the Father. And he says, God, your word is truth. Number one, Jesus authenticated at that moment what in his day was called the Bible. In Jesus' day, the word of God was 39, what we have in English, they had 22 books, but they're the same books. They just didn't split 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Samuel. Uh, they, they put together Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, you know what I mean? They had, they grouped them differently, but Jesus authenticated what we call the 39 books of the Old Testament. Basically, you can just call it the Old Testament. Jesus authenticated that and said, the word of God, 
the Old Testament, the 39 books, are truth. You know what he said aren't truth? What's bound in a lot of copies of the Bible? You ever heard of the Apocrypha? You ever heard of the Pseudepigrapha? All of these extra biblical books that for years have been bound into copies of the Bible? Jesus said no. No. Those things, by the way, were extant in Christ's day. He said those, those aren't. Those, those might have true statements in them. They are not the word of God that is truth. So Jesus authenticated the Old Testament. But what he said is, and, and, and this is what we're coming at, why should we study the Bible? Because only the Bible can sanctify us. It's the word of God that sanctifies us. What does sanctify mean? It means set apart. And it makes us holy instruments in God's hands. And so the more that we're in the word of God, the more our life is useful to the Lord. Well, God says his word is truth. And God says only that true word can sanctify us, set us apart as useful and pleasing to him. And so our walk with God can only begin with a settled conviction of the truthfulness of the Bible. And that's why this verse that I already quoted says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our walk with God begins with this belief that it's the word of God that can save our souls. The Bible says what it means, and the Bible means what it says, and we have to believe that. Well, next, seven reasons why God's Word is true. I believe the Bible is truly God's Word. First of all, and this is the most important, you don't need, and you've heard me say this many times, because Jesus believed it was true. Jesus didn't just believe it, he said it. Our Lord Jesus Christ believed in the verbal what does verbal mean? It means it isn't thoughts. That's why you have to be very, it's okay to have a paraphrase of the Bible, like the Living Bible. The Living Bible is a great, I've read it through several times myself. The Living Bible is not a, a rendition of the word-by-word -word inspired scriptures. It's Ken Taylor telling the Bible as a story to his children. He explains it. In fact, the Living Bible is like a sermon. It's just like, there's nothing wrong with hearing a sermon, but don't ever mix a sermon up with the scriptures. So Eugene Peterson's message is not a Bible. It's a sermon by Eugene Peterson about the Bible. And by the way, it's very well done, but it's not the Bible. Neither is Ken Taylor's living Bible, a Bible. Jesus held to the verbal inspiration of the Bible. And what he said is that God inspired words. And so there are two kinds of, of Bibles that we have nowadays. We have the word for word, the WFW, uh, and that is, there, there's a Greek word and a Hebrew word and a Greek and a Hebrew word, and there's an English word that stands above them. That is a verbal or word by word or word for word translation. Then we have uh, this, this whole idea of a paraphrase, you know, a PP. And there are, there are kind of like thoughts down here that the Bible has, and they take these thoughts and they write something very eloquent about them. Now, this paraphrase, the message, the living Bible, and by the way, there, there is a movement among Bible translators to this side of the fence. And what they call it is a, and, and it doesn't mean that, that these are all bad, but it calls it a dynamic equivalence. And what dynamic equivalence means is that they take this word and they say, well, in the first century it kind of meant this, but it doesn't mean that anymore, and this word, and so this is an equivalent kind of of what those words down there say. Now, a paraphrase makes no, it doesn't try and keep tied to the, to the Greek and Hebrew. A dynamic equivalence says it stays tied. But the problem we have now is that because culture does not like gender-specific roles, the dynamic equivalence Bibles are slowly, they're coming out with new versions. Like, did you know there's a new Muslim-friendly version of the Bible? Muslim-friendly. That's interesting. Then there's a, a gender-neutral. 
I mean, because there are a whole group of people that don't like uh, saying that, that God, did you know that, that God calls humanity man? It says, so God created man in his image, made he man, and he blessed man. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Adam and Eve. But he called Adam and Eve humanity, man, mankind, not humanity. He called it mankind because God has gender-specific orientation. Well, there's a whole group of people that don't like that, so they want a gender-neutral Bible that doesn't say our Father in heaven, it just says God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or they want a Muslim-friendly one that, that doesn't offend the Muslims by calling Jesus the Son of God, because God has no, Allah has no sons. So they root all that out. You can't root it out unless you go to this dynamic equivalence. And so this is a wall that you need to be very cautious about and make sure that you have a word for word translation of what God inspired. Next, that means every one of God's words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said, heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words are not going to pass away. And thus, every word that Jesus affirmed not only came through the Old Testament prophets, but the second part of the custodianship of the Scripture is, Jesus not only affirmed the Old Testament, but he said, and now I'm going to speak and I'm going to speak through my holy apostles. And the whole church is going to be built on a foundation of the holy apostles and the prophets. And so what Jesus said is, just like the prophets gave out the very word of God and he affirmed them, he said, I'm going to send my New Testament through those apostles. And so Jesus said, not only was the Old Testament without error, but what he was sending, the New Testament, would also be inerrant. And, and I want you to think about that, and I'll talk about it more when I'm done with this. Uh, so I believe the Bible is truly God's word. This is when I'm not supposed to talk to it. Come on, there we go. Because Jesus said so. Now think about what Jesus said. Jesus affirmed that there are no errors in science, history, or the moral areas of the Bible. He said the scriptures cannot be broken. There are no flaws. There are no, no um, sewn-in little, little areas that, that are flawed in the Bible. Jesus, in John 10, 35, says the scriptures cannot be broken. And he said, sanctify them through thy truth, in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. That is the definition of inerrancy. It's Christ's definition. That the scriptures cannot be broken. Do you know what broken means? It means you will not find a scientific error in the Bible. Now for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the Bible has pointed out scientific errors. Did you know when, when the whole world thought that the world was flat... Did you know, if you have an old science book, that science thought the world was flat? The Bible said that the earth is round. It says God sits enthroned. Remember we talked about the throne of God in heaven? And it says that he sits above the circle of the earth. God said in, in 700 B.C. that the earth was a circle. When did science figure that out? A long time after that. See, the Bible is scientifically accurate. The Bible is historically accurate. In fact, the Bible records civilizations, people, and cities that scientists have never found. Now, the Book of Mormon, on the other hand, which is not the Bible, has an entire civilization, group of people, cities, and everything that has never been found. No matter if you look where it says, in the Book of Mormon, if you look for what it says, none of it can be verified. None of it. It's all uh, untruth. But every historical point the Bible makes that you look for, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, is provable, as well as the moral areas. So, this evening, Jesus said, inerrancy is how we are to look at the Bible. 
Uh, Jesus affirmed the historical reliability of, look at these people. Jesus believed in a literal Adam and Eve. And he said, those are the first two humans. The first two. And one was made from the other one. The very first was Adam. And out of Adam was made Eve. Noah. And, and Jesus affirmed what we call the global flood. It wasn't local. It wasn't in Mesopotamia. It wasn't just, you know, the Mississippi getting out of its borders. Jesus affirmed what the Scripture said, that all flesh was killed. Jesus also believed in Abraham. He said he was a real person who lived, who knew Christ as God the Son. Jesus says that in John 8, 56. Jesus talks about Abel, about Moses. He talks about Elijah and David and Daniel and Jonah, and, and even says, like Jonah was entombed inside that great fish, I'm going to be in the earth. And did you know liberals, you know what a liberal is? I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking about theology. They're liberals are, do not believe in the miracles. Uh, they don't believe that Elijah did those miracles, that Jonah really was swallowed by this giant fish. They don't believe that Daniel was in a lion's den. Uh, they don't believe that the three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace. They certainly, you know, don't believe in a global flood. But Jesus did. And, and I think people don't realize, they have never really read these, these references, and Christians a lot of times don't realize that Jesus had such a high view of Scripture. In fact, uh, it, it stuns people. Uh, I remember, I've told you this many times, but I always think of it when I read this, that I was unpacking my books in Tulsa and, and uh, only had gotten my Bible out and was sitting on my, and this is 17, 18 years ago, had my Bible sitting on my desk and my secretary walked in and said, there's a man on the phone for you. I said, oh great, who is it? And she said, well, before you pick it up, you can be live on the air to the radio station that 300,000 people in Tulsa listen to. And she said, and it's the lunch hour and they're probably all listening. I said, oh, great. I said, what, what does he want? She says, he wants to talk to you. And he always calls every pastor as soon as they move in and ask him one question. I thought, well, I'm glad I got my Bible out, you know. And, and he, he got on and he says, hey, we only have a minute before the break. And he says, I just have one question for you. He says, do you believe, do you believe that the scriptures teach creation and that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings? And he paused. And he said, and by the way, we've been talking about this for an hour, and there's another pastor on the line, the pastor of the largest church in Tulsa that everybody knows and loves. And he's on the, he's on the phone with you, and we're all on the air, and now you have 40 seconds, he said, before the commercial break. What do you say? And I said, oh, yes. I said, yes, I believe that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings, and I believe in all the rest because Jesus did. And I paused, and there was this, uncomfortable 10 second silence on the phone I'm sure people started tapping their radios to see and he said Erling said Jesus did he believed that he said we'll be right back after the break to continue this talk and and we spent about 45 minutes and I just took him through the Bible and showed him all of these people that that Jesus affirms in the Gospels and, and he was stunned because he'd gone to church all his life at that biggest church where they had a liberal pastor who does not believe in miracles, nor does he believe in inspiration. You know, when you're looking for a church, the most important thing to check out is, do they believe in the deity of Christ and the inerrancy of the Bible? If they don't believe in the divine Christ, he can't save you because he is sinful He's not divine. He, he couldn't be the perfect sacrifice. And if they don't believe in the inerrancy of the Scripture, where do you start? What part of it is true? If there's any mistake, then there's many mistakes, and it's all to be suspect. Here we go. Second reason. Why do we believe the Bible? Most of all, because Jesus did. Secondly, because all the writers of the Scripture said so. There is a harmony of conviction among the 40-plus authors that God spoke through them. See, the, the key to inspiration is that it is not Isaiah talking. It is not Moses talking. It is not Paul talking. You know, people all the time say, well, Paul's opinion on women is one thing, but no. Paul wasn't speaking for himself. 
Paul and all the other writers said, God is speaking through me. In fact, thousands of times, all the writers said that they were totally convinced that they were sharing words that were not originating with them. They said, what I'm telling you is not from me. In fact, a lot of them backed up from what they said, and they said, you know what? The Lord said that. And it's almost like, don't get mad at me. I didn't say that. The Lord says And they always preface their writings with that. In fact, one of the key statements is what David said. This summarizes what they all say. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. It's him using me as a a channel through which his message came. He used me as the, the vessel and the tool. But it was his word that was in my tongue. He said this these songs that I'm writing, the Psalms, uh, these, these uh, scriptures that I'm inspiring, he's speaking out through me, and it's his word, not mine. Did you know that's the universal conviction of the 40-plus authors? You can find in every one of them some statement, it's not me. It's from him. So the second reason that I believe the Bible is truly God's word is, All the writers, not only did Jesus say it, but all of the writers of the scriptures over 1,600 years confessed that it wasn't them, it was Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of Christ speaking. Okay, we make two quick discoveries about the Bible. Number one, the Bible is made up of 66 separate books. Remember, the the Bible is a book of books, and it, it is the greatest book because it was penned by these 40 authors over several thousand years, actually over 1,600 years, um, a couple of thousand years, basically from Moses, 1446 B.C., through 96 A.D. So it's uh, just short of 1,600 years that these writers wrote. But what's amazing is most of them never met each other. When we lived in Rhode Island, uh, the U.S. government, our tax dollars were making the Trident submarines. Now, those are old school things. Uh, they have bigger and better stuff. But the Trident subs were amazing because it was the first time they, they contracted out this billion-dollar boat, and it was made in machine shops all over the country, pieces of it, because it was so so special. They didn't want any one company knowing all of our secrets, and so they farmed it out all over the place. They made every machine tool, uh, or every piece of the sub that was made, they made the place sign it with the name of the company and put a serial number on it, because they said if there's ever a defective piece, we want to know who made it wrong. Then all these pieces, with thousands of engineers involved were sent to Quonset Point in Rhode Island and there at the electric boat division they put those pieces together and you know what they found even after all the thousands of engineers and everything from time to time they'd come with two pieces that didn't fit now these are people all reading the same set of plans with engineers going between all these places and and they are looking at the same specs and pictures and everything The Bible was written on four different continents by 40 different authors over 1,600 years, most of which never met each other. And yet, they form an integrated message system that absolutely fits. In fact, that's that's one of the amazing things about the Bible. The more we study God's Word, the more we can see that the origin of this message, that's the Word of God, is from outside of our world. And in fact, think about how the Bible's written. The Bible is written like someone is up above looking down at what's going on, and they can hear what's being said inside the homes. Do you remember with Elisha, when when the Syrians, there were even Syrians back then, like are in the news today, it's in the same place, and there's still the Syrians, but the Syrians would come to attack Israel And the prophet Elisha would tell the Israelites what pass they were coming through. So they would come, and they'd have all their archers ready. And here would come these terrorists coming like this. And the archers would go, and they'd knock them all off. And the king would say, how on earth do they know 
what I'm whispering in my chamber. And see, it was that there's someone outside our world that was watching God up here, and he was looking down, and the whole perspective of the Bible is someone that has a perspective no one else could have. The scriptures are written seeing the outside event and seeing what the person is feeling and thinking and doing on the inside, and they're merged into one account. It's so clearly impossible for a human who isn't even at the event. Uh, and, And I could tell you stories. The destruction of Tyre is an example. Ezekiel, we were in Ezekiel this morning, Ezekiel talks about the destruction of the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. And basically, Tyre, this is the the nation of Israel, you know, the Sea of Galilee and all that, Dead Sea. And right off of the coast here was an island. And, And Tyre and Sidon were a coastal city and an island. And, and it was the home of the Phoenicians. If you ever heard of Hannibal, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, the whole attacking Roman elephants, well, that was the same group of people. But what happened is they had Carthage over here, and they had this Phoenician settlement here, and they had many others. And God said in 600 B.C., God said, this island is going to be destroyed by an attacker coming from the north. He's going to come and lay siege to the outside. He's going to progressively destroy it. He's going to level and scrape up the whole town, and he's going to put it in a causeway and actually make a land bridge out to the island and conquer the island. And God said that in 600 B.C. And there's a lot more details than that. You can read them in Ezekiel um, 26, 27, 28. Nothing happened, 600 B.C., 500 B.C., Ezekiel's long dead, 400 B.C., you know, everybody's long dead. And all of a sudden, in 300, and remember old Alexander in 300 and some B.C., started his campaign over here in Greece, and by the time he got here, he decided that he was going to take Tyre. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had tried, but he failed. Nebuchadnezzar tried right in here and and didn't do what God said was going to happen. So Alexander comes 300 years later, and he brings his forces up, besieges the city, kills everybody, throws all the rubble all the way out to that island, and did exactly what the Bible says 300 years before. And the island would never be re-inhabited, and they would spread fishing nets on it. And did you know to this day, if you go on a little if you're not hit by a Hezbollah rocket or something, if you go by, it's a whole, today the whole coast is a huge um, uh, PLO camp. But if you go and go by this island, they still spread their fishing nets on it, just like God said 600 years before Christ. How would Ezekiel have known that? Because the message came from outside of our world, from someone that sits above the earth and watches. Okay, I believe the Bible is truly God's word because of its incredible unity. I've already touched on this. And the unity is, the Bible's supernaturally designed unity is demonstrated by what I just said. The 40 plus men on three continents over 1,600 years, 60 generations come with one integrated message system. Every word, every detail has one unmistakable fabric woven. Whether it's from the prison, where as you know, Paul wrote many, whether it's David who's in the palace, uh, whether it's from a dungeon or a hillside to holy, holy places, there is one common theme, one united message, one system of doctrine and only one plan of salvation. They couldn't even get the parts of the trident right. And they worked over a 10-year period looking at the same papers. These 40 authors, most never met each other. Everything they wrote fits together. So the third reason you can tell the Bible's true is because of the unity. The fourth reason is one that you've probably heard. The simplest and most profound evidence of the Bible It's fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy, by the way, prophecy makes up about 30% of the Bible, 25 to 30%. Now think about that. Prophecy is an irrefutable verification found, look at this, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures only. You ever thought about that? Does anybody else venture into prophecy? 
Prophecy is the missing element in every other sacred scripture of the world's religion. Of all the world's religions, only God got into the prophecy business. You cannot find any prophecy in the Quran. You cannot find anything in, in Hinduism. Uh, you can't, the Persian mystery book, the Book of Mormon, uh, anything, the sayings of Buddha or Confucius or anybody else, nobody ventures into prophecy. Why? Because if it doesn't come true, then you know that you're lying. And if it does come true, Isaiah 41 says, then you know God is talking. God says, I, I wrote prophecy in so that you would know who's talking to you. He said, it's my calling card. It's the way you authenticate that it's me. He said, only I write the future in advance. I write the future, what's going to happen into the future. I write it for you. I write history before it happens. And God says, that's how you know it's, it's me. And that's what prophecy says in Isaiah 41, 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons. And right there in Isaiah 41, if you read the rest of that passage, he says, only the God of this universe, me, can tell what's going to happen in the future. And he is the one. So prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. Um, number five, the Bible is scientifically accurate. And what I mean by that is, uh, if we just look at, at the last few chapters of Job, and I'll show you this, it could prove the extraterrestrial nature of this book. Have you ever read an old biology book? It's funny. You read an old astronomy textbook? It's amazing because so much has changed. In fact, nearly every area of the sciences, there's a flux. There's change. They restate. They cast out the old disproved statements. Often, there's complete erroneous theories. And they have to retract them and do a, a reprint. But not with God. He says it right the first time. And every, what's interesting is I showed you that the Bible has been written, uh, you know, from 1446 B.C. all the way through 96 A.D., over 1,600 years. Throughout that entire 1,600 years' time, every single scientific fact that was stated is still true. And we're looking back 3,500 years. It's amazing. Let me just show you one example uh, from the book of Job. How about astrophysics? Now, there are many areas. Just talk about two, dark matter and gravity. Job says, where is the way where light dwells? As for darkness, where is its place? What Job says under the inspiration of God is, he said that there is a visible universe, and he says there is a place where things exist, that they are not visible. They are in the darkness. Now, he's not talking about... He, he doesn't describe this as light that, that is eclipsed. You know, like you, you can't see the backside of the moon, but it isn't dark matter. It's just not lit at the moment. There is in our universe, in fact, differing... Remember, the scientists change. God doesn't give a percent, but there was a time when they said as much as 99% of the universe, the mass, the weight of all of the objects in the universe were of dark matter. There's a whole realm of astrophysics that talks about this. What God said is, he says, yep, he says there is the visible universe and there is this invisible, which you can call dark. But he said it's there. Well, you say well, that's kind of, you know, that's iffy. Well, how about this one? This one is fascinating. Job 38, 31. It says, can you bind the sweet influence and two, two stellar objects are mentioned in the Bible. The Pleiades, that's a cluster of seven stars, the seven sisters. You probably look up sometime and you can see them up there. If you have 20, 20, uh, either corrected or non-corrected vision, you can count all seven. And, of course, Orion. You know Orion, the one that has the, the, you know, big four and then the belt and the sword hanging down. The constellation of Orion, which not only has the largest known star in the universe and it has a galaxy, but also it has the same thing that the Pleiades has. There's something that those two, those two constellations contain something that is not contained anywhere else in our entire visible night sky. Most people, other than astrophysicists, don't even know this. There are only two objects in the sky you can see with your eyes. 
that are gravitationally bound. In other words, when you look up at the sky and you see, uh, let's say, the Big Dipper, you know, coming down like this, it's not very good drawing, but when you see the Big Dipper, it would appear from where we're standing that all those stars are beside each other. But if you turn and see a distance, you'd find that one of the stars of the Big Dipper is here, and about a million light years away is another one, and about 10,000 more is this one, and this one. They are not anywhere close. They are millions and billions of miles apart. But in the whole night sky, among the stars, there are only two stars that if you look at them that way, the Pleiades would look like this. The, the seven stars of the Pleiades are gravitationally bound. In other words, they all have captured each other by their personal gravity. They're held. They don't, they stay together. They're a group. And if you looked at Orion's belt, you would find this star is tied to this one, this star is tied to this one, so all three of them are gravitationally bound. Those are the only two objects in the entire 8,000 visible stars in our night sky. And you know what the Lord said? He said, can you bind the influence of the Pleiades? He said something Something is holding the Pleiades together. Well, you know what everybody thought? Well, something's holding all of them together. Why didn't you say that about the Big Dipper? Because no one knew until the 20th century that, that the gravitational tug of stars and systems can be measured. And they measured. And lo and behold, only the ones God said were bound. See the bands and the bind? He said, these are tied. Now, that's a message that originated outside our world because nobody knew that. Only somebody that's outside the world. Uh, here's another one. Oceanography, Job 38 says, uh, have you entered into the springs of the sea and walked at the search of the depth? He talked about springs of the sea that were not visible. Now, if you're on the shore, there are many places where springs are, are gushing out of rocks and going into the ocean. He says, no, no. He says, have you ever seen the springs that are in the ocean? Now, this springs has, has two meanings. Uh, this could either be uh, water pouring into, you know, kind of like a gushing springs, you know, water coming up from the floor of the ocean, that there are places where water gushes up like it does on land, or it can mean a current. You know what? There, if you look, there are rivers of water beneath the surface of the ocean. Rivers that flow at different speeds, which is these, these underwater currents, not the ones on top, not based by weather. There are, and so we don't know exactly whether the Lord is talking about the vents. At the bottom of the ocean, they found that there are superheated vents, springs that are coming up, water that's coming up two miles deep. And there's a whole colony of creatures that live two miles deep in the ocean at these, these superheated vents uh, in the dark ocean depths. But these are two miles down. And the Lord says, hey, have you ever checked out the bottom of the ocean? He said, there's stuff down there I know about that you don't. And you know, for thousands of years, people said, oh, that's not true. Nobody can go to the bottom of the ocean until the 19th century. And when they went down there, they found what God said. Here, here's another one, ornithology, the study of birds. Did you know the animals have a migratory um, navigation that wasn't even closely imitated until satellite navigation? And God built what we would call a satellite global positioning system. And do you know what? It doesn't need batteries, and it doesn't need antennas, and it doesn't even need satellites. And it works inside of fish, birds, and insects. 
And we say, how, how do those butterflies find Monterey, Mexico every year? Uh, here's an even better one. How do salmon find, uh, you know, the Lord is talking about, let's get it all up here. Uh, the Lord is talking about who feeds the ravens. Well, let's, let's talk bigger than just the ravens. There are Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. There are 50 million of them who originated coming out of eggs as little tiny, you know, little tiny hatched salmon. And mom's nowhere to be found. Mom doesn't stay around and give them a pacifier. And they take off and they range as far as 4,000 miles from Bristol Bay. This is where they were spawned. This is where they originated. And while they're still little, they start floating on those currents and hiding for their life and getting away from their predators. And what's interesting is they have a reunion every year over three weeks' time. During that period of time, inside the little window of June and July, which you can work like clockwork, all 50 million of them from 4,000 miles away. You know what? I have trouble getting the kids from the basement to the dinner table. They get lost on the way. I'm not sure where they went. And, and they get distracted. Can you imagine 50 million independent little salmon that are 4,000 miles away from the dinner table all arrive every year in the same three-week window? I mean, that is nearly impossible to calculate how. In, do you know how big their brain is? Their brain is the size of a pea. How, where did they put the GPS? I mean, look how big the one is on your dash. And it doesn't even work most of the time. It gets all mixed up. You've got to drive in circles to reset it. I mean, okay, real quickly, one more minute. And uh, because of the archaeological verification, uh, this is one of my favorite, and I'll give it to you in a minute. This guy was a skeptic. You know what a skeptic is? Someone that doesn't believe the Bible. And he lived in the 19th century. He was very wealthy. He lived in England. His family had earned a lot of money and he had inherited it and he had nothing to do with his time. And so he decided that he would make fun of the clergyman who spoke up in his church he went to and claimed that this was the Bible. And he loved archaeology. He went off to Oxford and, and, and learned all about the science of archaeology. And so he made a challenge. He said, he, he, wealthy enough, he broadcast it in England. He says, I'm going to I'm going to disprove the historicity of God's word. And so his goal was to prove to England once and for all that the God they supposedly worshipped wasn't true. And he was going to use the book of Acts because the book of Acts lays down what looks like a triptych. It says, and Paul went to this city and he walked two days and went to this city and then he walked three days and went to this city and then he walked for seven days and went to this city and you know what in the 19th century this city and this city and this city and this city had never been found they were only in one place in the whole world in Acts so Sir William Ramsey said I'm going to disprove the Bible and he took his little tucked his Bible under his arm, sailed to Berga, which is a city in Turkey today, docked and said, Acts says that Paul walked three days, and after three days, he ended up in, where did I put, Antioch of Pisidia. I didn't even write it down in here, did I? Um, but he said, Pisidian Antioch, there's no such place. So he went on the Roman road that's still there and walked three days at a normal walk. And on the third day, he told his crew, okay, guys, dig along the road. See if you find anything. And at the end of a very minor excavation, they began finding pieces of marble that said Pisidian Antioch, which is exactly... What Acts 13 says, Paul stood in when he preached that great sermon in the synagogue. 
And Ramsey said, well, that's coincidental. Anybody could walk three days and find a city. He said, there's another one a week away. And he walked a week, and he found Lystra, and he found Derby, and he found Iconium. In fact, I could talk all night about what he found. There's even a word in the book of Acts. It's Asiarchs, Asiarches. And that word, Asiarch, is nowhere except in the Bible. And he said, ah, historical inaccuracy. And when they excavated, he had gotten down to Greece now, and when he excavated the city of Thessalonica, the first thing he found was a great big slab. It was at the front gate. And it said, the Asiarchs welcome you. And there's that word that's only in the Bible. Now it's everywhere because we know that that's what they called their rulers. Okay, basically all I'm saying is this. You can trust the Bible, but also you're late. So let's all stand. And as you stand, what, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a big difference because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you start out with a heart that says, Lord, I believe, show yourself to me. You know, that's how this book opens up. And that's what the Lord wants us to do is he wants us to trust him. And I trust the Bible because Jesus did. But there's lots of other reasons you can. But let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your living and abiding word of God. I thank you that your word proves to us that it's a message that comes from outside this world. That it's impossible humans could have known all those things. But we trust you. And the same God that keeps his word is the same God that lives within us. And you want to show yourself strong through us. And so I pray that you would increase our faith and help us to take you at your word. Believe your truth. Read it. Feed our souls upon it. And find it to be the sword that we can beat off all the fiery darts of the evil one who wants us to doubt you. And help us to resist him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. 